Welcome to episode 15 of the Jedi Temple Archives podcast. There is more knowledge here than anywhere else in the galaxy. Only members of the Jedi Council are allowed access. Guarding the holocrons is one of the most important duties a Jedi can be given. Do you think you're up to the task? Welcome to another episode of the Jedi Temple Archives podcast. Uh, we're back from vacation this week after a nine-day stay down at the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida, doing some scouting for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And we also had a chance to meet up with Tom and Michelle from the Hyperion Adventures podcast, who uh, actually had just recorded another episode of their Star Wars Remembered series, where we talked about Solo, a Star Wars story. And I'm very fortunate to have had a couple of different times where Tom and Michelle and myself and my wife, Kim, met up while we were down there, uh, which was awesome. And uh, I've got Tom back here with me today to talk a little bit about some of the things we experienced related to Star Wars down at the Disney parks and a little bit about some of the new information that's coming out for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at both Walt Disney World Resort and Disneyland. And uh, also when we get to our news segment, we're also going to have some additional information about Star Wars Celebration, which is coming to Anaheim in 2020. So, Tom, welcome and thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks, Rob. Always good to join you. And we had a great time seeing you out at the Walt Disney World Resort. Always a lot of fun with you and Kim. So uh, thanks for having us again. Absolutely. And it's always uh, always a comfortable conversation with you guys. We always have so many different topics that we can dive into and just have some great discussions. So. We had a lot of fun down there, but uh, certainly one of the things that we were focusing on on this trip was kind of, uh, you know, taking a step back and really looking at all the different ways that Star Wars content has already been incorporated into the Walt Disney uh, World Resort down there in Orlando. And I know that some of these things are also uh, mirrored out at Disneyland Resort, but for the Walt Disney World Resort specifically, most of these offerings are centered around Disney's Hollywood Studios, and there are a couple of newer offerings that are located over at Disney Springs, which is kind of the shopping area at the Walt Disney World Resort there. Uh, So what we will do for the purposes of this conversation is just kind of go down the list, and Tom and I will give a little bit of our feedback on the various things that we have experienced and uh, what any of you who maybe have visited Walt Disney World in the past or are planning to do so in the future for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge may want to focus on uh, because outside of the the land of Black Spire Outpost and Batu, there are other ways within the parks that you can have really great Star Wars experiences that are going to be a lot of fun for you as a Star Wars fan, for your kids, uh, if they're interested in that, and really anyone who loves that kind of immersive uh, type of atmosphere. So, uh, Tom, if you're ready, I think we'll dive right into it. Let's do it. Let's get to it. Awesome. So uh, in regards to, to Star Wars at uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios Park, uh, one of the iconic things that they have had in place for years is the Star Tours attraction. And that was originally released uh, back in the 80s and then underwent kind of a, a re-theming um, and overhaul where it was turned into Star Tours, The Adventure Continues. So what this particular attraction is, is a simulator attraction. Uh, Used to be piloted by DJ Rex, who, uh, sorry, Rex at the time, Captain Rex, uh, who has now been transitioned to DJ DJ Rex within Ogus Cantina and Black Spire Outpost. But um, it's really a randomly selected number of destinations that you visit on that trip. Uh, it is kind of a, a bit of a mishap how you get started on this particular adventure. C-3PO is uh, at the center of that, and as so many of his adventures are, it's just kind of uh, an off-the-cuff mishap uh, with R2-D2 kind of riding along as his co-pilot, and you are uh, tasked with delivering a rebel spy who is a randomly selected member of that particular transport 
to the rebellion on one of those randomly selected planets. So uh, I know that Tom and I have both been on this attraction numerous times. Tom, uh, I'm guessing that out there at Disneyland is pretty similar to what we experience at Walt Disney World. It's almost exactly the same. I mean, the setting is different outside. It looks uh, much more immersive when you're outside at Hollywood Studios at the Walt Disney World Resort. It's kind of got this indoor feel with an an ATAT out there out front and everything. It just is. It's a better entrance into it. But the ride, the attraction itself, once you get into the queue inside the building, it's virtually identical. Yeah, and definitely what Tom just mentioned is a great point. Uh, Outside of the attraction at at Disney's Hollywood Studios, there are some really great backdrops for getting some photos. You've got an at-at out there. You've got kind of the Ewok village up in the trees. Uh, There's a speeder bike that you can get some really great photo ops around. Is is the speeder bike still there? I thought they took that away for a while. I think they took it away and refurbed it and then brought it back. So Sorry to interrupt. Remember the note when they took it away. I wasn't sure if they were moving that over to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge or what. Yeah, no, it was definitely gone for a while. And there was some question about whether it was coming back. Uh, But my understanding is that it it has returned. I didn't actually specifically go looking for it on this trip. But, you know, again, the attraction, the cool thing about it is that as new Star Wars films come out, they will tend to integrate those planets that maybe were visited within those Star Wars films. So Force Awakens came out. You've got the opportunity to visit Jakku. Uh, Last Jedi came out. They implemented a crate, a scene within crate where you're going through the crystal caves. Uh, within the attraction. So there's a lot of fun add-ons that come out with each new movie. And one of uh, the new additions that they have kind of brought back at Walt Disney World, at least when we were there, was that the final destination on your journey was arriving at the planet of Batu and Black Spire Outpost, which was kind of a a cool uh, way to merge into this time frame where we're going to have Galaxy's Edge opening right at the end of what they consider spring, what we're going to call summer uh, at the end of August at Walt Disney World Resort. Yeah, it's a nice it was a nice tease for it. Uh, they've had it at Disneyland for a while as well. Uh, obviously, since they've opened up Black Spire Outpost, uh, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge out at the Disneyland Resort, they don't need to have that anymore. They're not previewing anymore. It's there for you. But it, they are obviously getting set for it out at the Walt Disney World Resort. And yeah, right now, I, I know if you currently are going on uh, Star Tours, the adventure continues. You do go through that, uh, the the Force Awakens part and the uh, the, uh, the Last Jedi part as well, finishing up with the, the Batu uh, landing and, you know, the excitement of, oh, looks like great things are here to come, you know. Yeah, and definitely what they do when they integrate some of these uh, new scenes into it, they will tend to have less randomization within the ride. You tend to get a more consistent set of destinations, but, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, they'll start mixing it up again and, and you can have all kinds of different experiences flying snow speeder or flying alongside the snow speeders on Hoth is uh, one of the rarer ones, at least in my experience, but uh, certainly a cool experience. And uh, really, it's just always a fun ride. It's always a treat to see who gets selected as the Rebel spy more often than not. It seems to be a kid and that always kind of gets the family excited. So um, there's a you know, it's been around for upwards of 30 years at this point. Um, but, you know, again, it's still an iconic part of Star Wars at both the the Disneyland Park as well as Walt Disney World Resort at Hollywood Studios. Yeah, it's 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 a great attraction. Uh, you know, it doesn't really fit uh, canon wise in many regards because you're jumping from different time periods to different planets. To, you know, the intermingling of uh, some characters that n- were never in the same uh, time sequence. You know, but it still is a lot of fun and just you know getting out there in that Star Wars universe. And uh, up until what's happened to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, it really was a, a a great way to experience Star Wars at the parks for sure. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how people, uh, you know, how loyal people are to it when they get a chance to ride Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run and more to the point, the Rise of the Resistance attraction, which by all indications is going to be one of the most incredible new attractions that Walt Disney World has released in quite some time. Yeah, we uh, when we were just at the Walt Disney World Resort, we actually did. uh, They have a a thing you can sign up for, which is lunch with an Imagineer. And you have to book it way ahead of time. It's a little pricey, but... uh, you really get to sit down with an Imagineer and we got to happen to sit down with one who was working on Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at the Walt Disney World Resort 
And he said, yeah, you know, this, we love this land. It's great. Uh, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run is awesome and everything, but just wait until you get, uh, you get to Rise of the Resistance because that is going to blow your doors off. He, he just, it's, it's, it's just going to throw you for a total loop. So just made me that much more excited for once that attraction finally opens up both out here at the Disneyland Resort nearby where I live and out there, of course, in Florida at the Walt Disney World Resort. Yeah, and then uh, you know we talked about that uh, lunch that you guys were able to have with the Imagineer, and and I know that you were kind of trying to see if you could winnow out any additional information about Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And I'll preface this by saying that what what was revealed to you is by no means an absolute, but it did sound like they kind of had a time frame in mind where they were aiming to get Rise of the Resistance up and running at the Walt Disney World Resort. And you know, are you are you comfortable revealing some of that information? Sure, it's not really a spoiler because. Because he didn't really tell us anything. I, I, he couldn't really tell us anything. But the one thing he did kind of, because I, I, I did, well, I didn't press him on it, but I said, you know, is there anything you could tell us? You know, you know. And he said that. Look, what I can tell you is that we originally planned for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge to be opened up in fall of 2019. Now, the end of fall. And then he said, like, we, we pushed it up to, we, we have it all ready to go. We're going to, we pushed it up. We're opening it earlier than that. But the end of fall is, I believe it was December 21st or something like that. I think is what the day he said, he said, we're working hard to make sure that the land is completely opened by at least that date. So I, I think you can expect by what he was saying that, that rise of the resistance will be open at the Walt Disney World Resort by at least the end of fall, December 21st, if I'm correct on that date, if not before that yeah and i agree it's not really a spoiler but it is good to kind of get an indication that while they did uh kind of move up the opening for phase one of star wars galaxy's edge at both the disneyland park as well as walt disney world that it you know and the plan was always as you mentioned it was going to be uh late spring of 2019 that it was going to open at disneyland park uh late fall at Walt Disney World Resort, and it looks like they're most likely still aiming for those deadlines for Phase 2 opening, which will include Rise of the Resistance. Uh, so at least it gives us the information that they they seem to still feel like that is an achievable goal, and it's not something where they're having an issue with any of the technology, and they know that it's going to have to get pushed beyond that. Um, but again, uh, anything can happen, and uh, at least it gives us some hope that we may still see it all within this year. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, they actually said for the Disneyland Resort, it's supposed to be open in summer. So I think that it, going by, and we didn't discuss this at all with the Imagineer, but uh, going by that... Uh you know, waypoint that he had set for uh, Walt Disney World Resort, I think that means by the end of summer. So I, I haven't looked out to see what the last day of summer is, but I would expect whatever the last day of summer is, you can expect the rise of the resistance to be open out of the Disneyland Resort by that time as well. Yeah, it should be probably September 20th, 21st. It's, uh sounds like it's the equinox and the solstices that they base their dates off of. So Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So that that is definitely something that we're all looking forward to. But certainly, you know, we had the conversation with Tom a, a few weeks ago um, about his experiences out at, at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge in the Disneyland Park. And we will get back into that a little bit later in the show, because I know that you and Michelle were able to get out there again for another visit. Um, and you got some additional experiences that you weren't able to fit in on the first trip, so I'll definitely want to hear about those. Um, but sticking with the information on, on what is currently available within Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World Resort, um, the next thing in terms of uh, popularity, especially with younger guests, and this is for kids that are age 4 through 12, uh, are able to sign up for what's called Jedi Training the Trials of the Temple. And this uh, is something that if you want to have your kids involved, then you're going to need to get to the park around rope drop, if not uh, before, and kind of make your way directly to the sign up uh, for this particular uh, experience. And they will give you a return time based on how uh, early you get there and what time you're looking for. But this allows the kids to, they kind of are paraded through the park in their Jedi robes. Uh, they're given a lightsaber. It's right next to Star Wars Launch Bay. I'm sorry, not Star Wars Launch Bay, but uh, right next to Star Tours, the adventure continues. And there's a stage there where the Jedi Masters will walk them through the process of 
summoning uh, a Sith Lord. Typically, it's Darth Vader. It could be Kylo Ren. In some cases, it's not a Sith Lord. It's a Seventh Sister or uh, Darth Maul, who who would qualify. But uh, the kids actually get to go through the process of dueling with these uh, various figures, and it's always something that's well attended. There's lots of parents around. Uh, it's kind of a cool thing for the kids to get to take part in, and it is always something that fills up very quickly. So uh, I'm guessing, you know, Tom, I don't know if you've ever had any of either of your kids that participated in this or the predecessor to it, uh, but I'm definitely guessing you guys have seen it when you've been in the parks. Yeah, I haven't had, uh, our kids were a bit too old to, to uh, when it eventually came around to, to uh, be in it, but I have had other family members' kids who have been in it and we've witnessed it many times. We actually find it entertaining to stop for a little bit and watch because you just never know. It's it's The show is usually mostly the same, but because you're throwing in young kids in there, there's always a, a little uh, tweak that happens every once in a while. Some kid goes off the, you know, on the map a little bit and does something a little different, so it's always kind of interesting to check out and see what happens, but it's, it's, it's enjoyable and the kids always seem to get a kick out of it for sure. Yeah. There are some great videos out on YouTube. If you, uh, if you happen to go search those up where exactly what Tom is talking about has happened, where you get a kid that just spazzes out with their lightsaber. Um, fortunately they've kind of, they used to do this with the lightsabers that you kind of flip them to extend the blade. Um, now they're more of a flix, a fixed blade lightsaber, which is a little bit more reliable and the kids don't have as much trouble quote unquote igniting them um but again i've i've seen the jedi master have to restrain one of the students um and there's been other funny things you know darth vader's lightsaber uh, the blade popping off that so there's definitely always the opportunity for a funny moment amidst uh what's really a cool experience yeah it's just it's entertaining and it's it's fun and it, yeah if you have your kid involved it's really great but even if not just if you happen to be in the area you're you're always looking for something to do in between your next fast pass or in between your next meal or whatever just stop by there and observe because it really is enjoyable at times to watch these kids and light up and have such a great time you know playing out the role of, as, as a jedi yeah and they are all so excited when they uh when they march through the park and as they get there and uh, begin their exercises and confronting uh, whichever uh dark side wielder they get faced against um they are just completely into it and it is definitely a lot of fun to watch also right there in that area of hollywood studios there is a theater uh that runs about a 10 minute film called star wars path of the jedi and it's something that's not always in operation uh, more often than not when we've gone it has been and it's it's really just kind of a quick refresher course in the star wars canon uh to date um and again it's it's not something that I would necessarily plan a day around. Uh, but if you're looking for a place to go in and cool off, get a little bit of a Star Wars fix. Um, and if you have younger kids that are not really that familiar with uh, Star Wars, uh, the overall story of Star Wars, it's kind of a good way to introduce them to that and kind of get them interested. Um, it's been a little while since I've actually gone in and, and viewed this. I don't know, Tom, if you guys have watched it recently. Uh, we did uh, not this last trip, but like uh, I think the trip before that we did. It's been about a year now since we've seen it, but uh, and they also have it out at the Disneyland Resort as well, and it, it, it is. It's enjoyable. And yes, it, it, you know, especially if you're out in Orlando in the summer or most of the year for that matter, it can be really hot. It's a nice play to just get out of the heat for a little while, sit down for a little bit and just enjoy it. And I'm a big fan of both audio and uh, video editing. And I think they've done a magnificent job with it. It's always entertaining. It's always pumps you up, uh, you know, if you're as a Star Wars fan to go through it. And, I, you know, yes, like you said, it's not going to be the best thing you're going to do Star Wars. Wars wise at any of the parks, but it is an enjoyable 10 or so minutes just to take out of the, of your day and, and relive some of the great moments in star Wars. Yeah. Um, speaking of reliving great moments in star Wars, the other offering within, uh, 
Hollywood Studios, which is really kind of an offering that has a number of offerings within it, is Star Wars Launch Bay. And again, I think this is another one of those things that uh, is replicated out there at Disneyland Park as well, Tom? Yeah, uh, we have uh, the Launch Bay out in uh, Disneyland Park as well. Uh, it's actually where they, what used to once be the building that was the Carousel of Progress before that had moved <laughs> along out to the Walt Disney World Resort. But uh, yeah, it's just a great little museum type area. Lots of, uh, you know, actual models and uh, actual uh, used items from the films. And, you know, it's just kind of a great, another great t- place to kind of get out of the heat, walk around, check out a lot of things that are involved in Star Wars and, and see like some of these ships that you see on the screen kind of up close as models. And, you know, you can pick out little details in them that's interesting to see that how much detail work they do for these models. Yeah, and what we love about it is every time we go back, there's things that have changed. As Tom mentioned, there's always uh, items on display that are either actual, you know, film-used props or replicas of those. Um, And it gives you a chance. It's not just weapons. It's not just ships. It could be uniforms. It, you know, they've got Anakin's pod racer. Um, they've got, you know, items from really any number of periods uh, throughout the Star Wars canon. Uh, and they keep refreshing that. There's also uh, an area where you can go down and they have three various character meet and greets that you can do within uh, the launch bay itself. The first being a BB-8, uh, the astromech from um, Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Uh, you get to meet him. And the cool thing about him is he's very uh, interactive with the guests as they're meeting him. So he's bobbing around. He's beeping and bopping. Uh, and he's pretty animated uh, for a meet and greet. Um and then they also have two additional meet and greets, one being Kylo Ren. And this was actually something that we had done when we were down there uh, for our wedding in 2016. And the interesting thing about this meet and greet is you kind of are waiting around a corner for him. So if you're next in line to meet him, you can't see him. You can't see where uh, the photo op has taken place. And my wife actually had her back to where he came around the corner. And when she turned around and saw him, she literally like started and and backed up because he was he was tall and imposing and definitely menacing um and again they've got uh you know the voice uh, you it's the voice of kylo ren he's got a number of different phrases that uh, he can speak and you know he just stays very well in character and it's a lot of fun to do that particular meet and greet um, and then the final one is a Chewbacca meet and greet, which I always have loved doing. Uh, my son, uh, when we did that uh, last uh, two trips ago, um, he actually was wearing a Stormtrooper T-shirt. So Chewbacca kind of took exception to that. Um, but again, the, the guys that they have uh, playing these characters within this particular uh, attraction within Hollywood Studios totally stay in character. Uh, they're awesome to, to meet and take a picture with. And that's really something that you can kind of take home and, and have uh, as a great memory of your trip. Wait, there are guys playing these? I actually thought I met Kylo Ren and Chewbacca the other day. I'm, I'm now I've just thrown for a complete loop. Right, right. <laughs> and I know I was I was just going to say, I know that they've got uh, these same characters that are now kind of running free within Star Wars Galaxy's Edge as well, which uh, has got to be kind of taking that to another level. It's not something where you're going to necessarily stop with them and have a meet and greet, although it is my understanding that Kylo Ren will stop people throughout the land and uh interact with them so yeah it, it does happen and, and stormtroopers the same but the stormtroopers are constantly uh moving throughout the crowds and interacting with people and you can get selfies and uh photos with them as well but the, it's it is really uh, fun i was going to also say as far as uh if you're going to the launch bay and you happen to be a disney visa rewards card holder there is a special meet and greet usually held every day in the launch bay that uh, you can meet a lot of times it's either kylo ran or sometimes it's darth Vader. But if it's it's an advantage you get, a perk you get for having that card that you kind of get a fast pass to meet one of these characters. You don't have to wait as long as uh, for some of the other meet and greets. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the other kind of cool thing about the launch bay and the area surrounding it is there are almost always a couple of first order stormtroopers that are patrolling and kind of stopping citizens walking around the studios, uh, interrogating them. Occasionally, they may find someone who's walking around with a lightsaber 
trooper and they will arrest them as a Jedi and uh, march them off for interrogation. So uh, there's been a lot of fun interactions I've seen with those uh, First Order stormtroopers. Actually, when we were down there uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was... Uh, taking some video of the launch bay itself and the stormtrooper came over and was checking out the camera and turned it off on me. And so, uh, you know, they, they definitely do a great job of staying in character and really, you know, having some fun interactions with the guests. Yeah. I actually, I love the interactions with the stormtroopers. I think the most of all of them, because they are really all over the place and they have, yes, they have some sort of, uh, phrases built into their, uh, their helmets or whatever, but it, they, they use it very well. It, it, it works out and with so many different and then the the, you know, the how the people react to it the guests react to it also plays into the show as well it's just a lot of fun Right. And so that actually kind of dovetails really nicely into the next couple of uh, various, they're not really attractions, they're more, uh, you know, displays or um, shows that you get to watch that are Star Wars related within Hollywood Studios. The first of which is called Star Wars A Galaxy Far, Far Away. And this is a stage show that occurs numerous times throughout the afternoon. Um, The schedule can change day to day, but uh, there's usually a listing of it uh, on a couple of boards within Hollywood Studios itself as well as in your Times Guide and it's a state show that has Stormtroopers, it has Darth Vader, it can have Boba Fett, it's got Imperial Officers, you've got Captain Phasma, you've got uh, 3PO, uh, R2-D2, BB-8, so uh, they'll bring Ray out, so it, they mix it up, sometimes they'll add new characters as new films come out but it is a pretty entertaining uh, thing to stop and watch. And it also kind of dovetails into another event that they do throughout the parks during the day, which is the March of the First Order. And I know, Tom, you and Michelle had had uh, partaken in uh, a tour that they offer for Star Wars within Hollywood Studios. And they kind of gave you some tips about uh, March of the First Order. Yeah, well, well, we didn't know it was a tip at the time. We actually thought that this was part of this tour that we were going on they're like okay you'll get to march with the first order uh so you they they take us down to the end of hollywood boulevard near the entrance gate of disney hollywood studios and that's where the march of the first order comes out at and what you do is you you kind of Poise yourself there by the gates from the uh, from the back lot. There, they will come out, and if you just there'll be some uh, some sort of guides behind them, and if you just line up right behind them as they march by, uh, don't try and pass the the uh, attendees that are there. But if you just walk behind them at an even pace, you can walk the virtually the entire stretch of Hollywood Boulevard and march behind them. And yes, that was, first we saw that as part of the tour. We thought, hey, hey we're getting to do this as part of this tour. No, anyone can do that. So if you're going there and you want to march with the First Order, you can march right behind them. You can get great pictures, great videos. Uh, we you, we do it virtually every time we're there now because it's, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, and they're all led by Captain Phasma. Uh, again, they will stop kind of along their parade route. And uh, if they see someone who's got a clear rebel affiliation, they may call them out. Uh, if they see someone who's clearly aligned with the the resistance i'm sorry the first order uh or more of an imperial persuasion they will usually stop and and make some kind of comment about how they're serving the galaxy uh, admirably and again it's just very interactive it's a fun thing to watch it definitely gets people's attention when they're marching through the studios they've got the music blaring and uh it's definitely a very military feel to the whole thing it was pretty funny we were we were actually doing the march the last time we were there during this last trip to walt disney world and it, when they did that part where they stopped, we were all stopped there and we we're watching them and they're going to the crowd. And there's this one young man there. You're bad. <laughs> just screaming at him. And it was just so hilarious. Everybody was cracking up. Time to break out the binders. <laughs> And, you know, I, I will say this, that as we just mentioned, there is a tour. Um, I'm uh, spacing out a little bit right now on what the cost is currently, uh, but I think it's eight hours. Um uh, and uh, right, right. It's eight hours. Uh, they basically take you through all these various uh, attractions as well as, you know, some additional uh, interactions throughout the land. And 
Uh, I know, Tom, you and Michelle had said you'd done this in the past and that it was a, definitely a great way to spend a day. Um, I actually have not partaken in this, uh, but I've done all the various attractions and everything kind of individually. Um, what, you know, what were the perks really of, of doing it through the tour as opposed to just kind of doing it yourself? Well, we did it early on. I'm actually, it was within the first few days when they first started running this tour and it's changed a little bit since then but when we first start be, began you, you you would go on this tour they'd give you uh a name tag in our best your name in our best and you'd get assigned a planet we got jakku as our planet apparently that's our home planet and uh and you get a lanyard and some other things but then they take you on this tour and they kind of describe we have two tour guides and they kind of go through the details of how star wars is in you know came to be a part of disney and how they're working within it and how they've had to adapt it in many ways as uh once they uh, came to own lucasfilm and then you get like uh you get some uh, cuts into uh, Star Tours. The adventure continues. Uh, if you have any uh, younglings there with you, they get. Uh, you don't have to worry about being there at rope drop to sign them up for Trials of the Trent Temple. They will get in and be involved in that. Uh, you know, and they they, they they just take you through all the different things uh, Star Wars related that are in the parks, and it's really interesting. And then when we did it, I don't think they do this anymore. Uh, you actually also got into the dessert party before the Star Wars. Gal Galactic Spectacular, so you would go to the dessert party, and then they'd escort you out to a an area there that's cordoned off just for you to for great viewing of the show itself. Yeah, and that's actually a perfect tie into the very next thing we were going to talk about, which is the Star Wars uh, Galactic Spectacular fireworks uh, show. It's not just fireworks; they also do projection mapping on the uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater, uh, which is right there at the end of Hollywood Boulevard, and they do a lot of really cool uh, scenes from the various Star Wars films. Uh, they have uh, some laser uh, projections that they do as well. And so they incorporate fireworks. They incorporate all these uh, various other components. And it's a great show. Um, definitely worth getting there a little bit early and getting a prime spot. There's a couple of projection towers kind of right as you're coming into the plaza uh, there in front of the Grauman's Chinese Theater. And... Um, I would definitely say if you can get back by those projection towers kind of between them or just forward of that, that's going to give you your best viewing to be able to see the, the full scope of what's going on there. Um, and as Tom mentioned, there is also a dessert party uh, where you can get kind of a cordoned off viewing area. Uh, it can be a little bit pricey. Uh, I Again, I, I need to double check the pricing on this currently. But the interesting thing about that dessert party is it takes place within Star Wars Launch Bay. Um, they they have all kinds of tables set up down there. You'll have some characters kind of interacting with you uh, throughout the course of that dessert party. They've got both sweet and savory items as well as some alcoholic beverages if you are uh, of age and care to partake in that. So, you know, again, as opposed to some of the other dessert parties that they offer around Walt Disney World Resort that don't include that option for an alcoholic beverage it might be um, you know a, a way to get a little bit more value out of that and again whether you do the dessert party or whether you just happen to go stake out a spot and watch the the fireworks and laser projection show uh just as a regular guest in the park uh certainly worth watching we we tend to watch that every time we go down there uh and it's always entertaining yeah it's a, it's a great show and they've adapted it over the years and added new things as the new films uh and new shows come out and it it, it really is impressive uh and just an excellent show i took our family members this last time to see it for the first time and they were just wowed by the whole thing uh also there's a pre-show it's not star wars but there's an animation pre-show there so you can stake out a good spot there early they have a sh that show before it and then they have the star wars show i would suggest you get there before phantasmic lets out because that's what everybody floods from phantasmic to this area to watch this show or to head out you know from there and it kind of goes through this this area nearby so um if you're going to stake out a good spot i would definitely get there before phantasmic lets out yeah and definitely grab a times guide when you get to the park it will tell you what time these shows start uh, and give you a better idea of when you kind of need to get staged so that you're not in danger of running into the big crowds that are coming out of phantasmic or you know uh, possibly whether you need to 
to get there early enough since they have the animation show that takes place beforehand just a little bit earlier to make sure you get the the viewing spot you want because the last thing especially if you've got kids with you the last thing you want to do is show up toward uh you know just within five or ten minutes of the show and risk a situation where you know the adult might be able to see fine but uh your kids don't get to see any of the projections and they can only catch part of the show uh Definitely, if anything you can do to get yourself a, a good viewing spot will be to your benefit. Yeah, even if you just have somebody in your party just kind of stake out an area early while you do a couple of things, or maybe you trade off a couple of times. You don't have to actually do it. I mean, if you get there, I don't know. We got there last time about uh, 45 minutes early or something like oh, that. Yeah. And uh, we had the, the best spot. The rest of our family was doing Tower of Terror, and we had a great spot. And they just walked up and joined us, and we had front and center. And it was it was really, a really uh, great spot to witness the show. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's great advice. I mean, we always tend to bring um, kind of a foldable uh, parade blanket type thing uh, with one of us on our backpack and a couple of, you know, inflatable cushions or whatever, if, if we're planning on even a 45 or uh, longer minute wait. So that's a nice way that you can kind of have a chance to sit down and cool off and relax uh, a little bit before the show starts. And by that point in the day, it tends to be uh, not the blazing heat that you can run into in the summer down there. So uh, certainly worth doing. Yeah, it's even a, a good use for those rain ponchos that you'll want to bring with you out there. If, you, if, you, if you've gotten through the day and they're relatively dry, you can also lay those out on the ground. So some sort of ground cover if you don't want to carry a blanket or whatever as, as well with you. Yep. Great tip. So uh, the only other thing that we really have to cover here within Hollywood Studios is there are a number of locations there that are a couple locations currently. There will be more when Star Wars Galaxy's Edge opens, but uh, that sell Star Wars related merchandise within the park. The primary one being uh, Star Wars Launch Bay, uh, which has a great uh, gift shop that has a little bit more of high end items. Uh, interesting thing about the, the gift shop in Launch Bay is if you go just out the, through the back of, of the uh, shop portion of it. There is an art gallery as well that sells various Star Wars art that is on sale. Um, and there is some really cool items that they have in there. It's always changing. There's always new things. Uh, but they have some really impressive pieces of Star Wars artwork in there uh, that I would recommend anyone who's interested in that type of thing take a look at. And within the shop itself, uh, they do have some you know stuff that's more geared toward kids there's some small models there's some um some kind of build a droid stations build a lightsaber station but they also have more of the high-end type replica stuff uh various models of starships or characters um uh, occasionally they'll have a full suit of Darth Vader's armor. They'll have pieces of stormtrooper armor that you can purchase, uh, lightsaber replicas, the hilts themselves, or some of the FX sabers uh, that you can purchase. So there's a lot more of that that level of merchandise within Star Wars Launch Bay. If you're looking for something that's more, uh, you know, affordable maybe for the kids in your family, uh, as you come out of Star Wars, the adventure continues. It feeds you right into the Tatooine Traders gift shop. And there is a lot of the same type of things in regards to the build a droid or the build a lightsaber, but then they have a lot more of the Star Wars themed merchandise, Star Tours themed merchandise, um, you know, plushes, t-shirts, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas the clothing that is within launch bay is a little bit more high end it's it's uh nicer uh gear jackets and things like that so um and outside of hollywood studios itself uh you can also go over to disney springs they have a couple of merchandise locations one is called the star wars galactic outpost and the other is the star wars trading post and again they have a lot more of the you know kid friendly merchandise the t-shirts some of the uh play sets things like that uh that you can look for for your family if you're over in uh, Disney Springs area. Yeah, just like you were talking about with Disney's Hollywood Studios, uh, it's very similar at uh, Disneyland Park. If you go into the Launch Bay, uh, same kind of type of items, same type of artwork there as well. And then if you're coming out of uh, Star Tours, the adventure continues the, into Star Traders, or you, you can also, of course, enter in from on your own without going on the attraction. That is a lot of where a lot of the T-shirts and hats and some of the other items are found in Disneyland Park. 
Yeah, and it probably bears mentioning here that even though there will be more shopping locations uh, for Star Wars fans once Star Wars Galaxy's Edge opens, the merchandise that you're going to find within Galaxy's Edge is not your quote-unquote Star Wars theme merchandise. This are, these are going to be items that are more in-world, uh, realistic types things. You can still you know do the, the Savi's uh, lightsaber workshop and build a lightsaber. Uh, Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities is going to have a lot of things that would be in world items the holocrons and the kyber crystals and those types of things but you're not going to find a star tours hat within galaxy's edge and you're not going to find a, a t-shirt that says you know star wars rise of skywalker within that particular land uh so it just bears noting that you know if you're planning on going for galaxy's edge you may have to go to some of these other locations to get your more generic star wars themed merchandise yeah as a matter of fact you won't even see a lot of stuff that says star wars galaxy's edge within star wars galaxy's edge uh, you, you uh you see a lot of stuff for batu black spire outpost and all that but if you want to get your uh galaxy's edge merchandise you're going to need to go to either the launch bay or the star trader in disneyland right now Yep, that's excellent advice. Uh, we just don't want people to get into Galaxy's Edge and be looking for that Galaxy's Edge t-shirt and end up uh, wasting a bunch of time looking for something that they're not going to find. So the, the one other item that I do want to bring up uh, that is a Star Wars related experience and that does exist over at Disney Springs and has been out there for a couple of years now is uh, over at the Void at Disney Springs. And they have since implemented um, the new VR experience, Ralph Breaks the Internet. But since they opened, they have had a VR experience called Star Wars Secrets of the Empire. And I cannot stress enough, I've now done this twice. Um, and both times we had an amazing time. It takes up about 30 minutes of your time, so it's not a huge time investment. Uh, and about 15 minutes of that is the actual VR experience itself. But when you walk in, uh, you're going to be asked to register on a couple of tablets that they have. Uh, they have some stations set up for you uh, to put in your information, to accept the disclaimers. You have to fill out one for yourself. And um, if you have any children with you, you have to fill out one for each of them. And then once that is done, they will kind of cue you up for your turn in the experience. Uh, when your turn comes, they will take you into a briefing area where uh, a captain will appear and kind of give you your mission briefing. And from there on, uh, you're essentially a member of uh, the Rebellion. And this is all kind of set in a pre-Rogue One um, world. So this is pre the original trilogy. And you're going to take on the role of a stormtrooper and I'm not going to get a lot into the mission. I don't want to spoil that for anybody, uh, but there it's just an incredible experience. Um, when you talk, you sound like a stormtrooper. When you look around, you're looking at your, you know, your fellow team members. It's awesome. If you have uh, someone who is particularly short or a child, uh, because they are like the mini me of stormtroopers and look hilarious. Um, but you will, you know, progress through this VR experience. And the thing that's nice about this is as opposed to some VR experiences where you may be just in a big empty room and as you reach out, you can't feel the walls that you're seeing. Within this experience, what you see in front of you, if you reach out and there's a wall there, there's a wall there. If there's a control panel there, you feel a control panel. So if you've done VR before and been a little bit disoriented, I have not, nor have I heard of many people that have had any of that type of issue uh, within this particular experience. And you get so immersed in it, you will be throwing yourself around. Uh, there's some puzzle solving, there's some action, uh, and there is an awesome end scene to it uh, that is totally worth your time doing. So I cannot stress enough uh, that this is something worth your time. It's 30 five dollars a person which again just over a dollar a minute but again this is entertainment that you're really not going to find anywhere else and it's a great unique experience that i would recommend for any star wars fan um and the final thing i will say about this is you will see advertisements for this around uh disney world in general but more specifically you'll see them a lot at disney springs and if when you're done you mention or actually when you sign up if you mention that you've seen the posters and are interested in the free photo uh they will take some photos at the end with you in your VR gear and you will get a free digital photo along with kind of a mission dossier and your stormtrooper wanted, uh, you know, 
uh, image with with whatever the bounty is out on you, uh, which is kind of a cool little keepsake to have from the experience. So uh, again, I would recommend this to anyone. I know, uh, Tom, I, I'm going to keep badgering you until you do this with me. And I keep wanting to do it. We just haven't <laughs> been able to get our drag ourselves out to either Disney Springs or downtown yeah. Disney, which they have it on both coasts, by the way. If you, yeah. if you want to go out, if you're more around the Disneyland Resort, you can go to downtown Disney and do the exact same thing. Well, that'll be my selling point. I'll, I'll try to push for it when we get out to Disneyland because I haven't done it out there yet. There you go. So you got to yeah. try a new experience. Maybe so completely right, right. different on the West Coast. <laughs> of, of course. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with that. The only, the only other piece of advice I will give uh, people who have not done this experience before, there is a point where as a stormtrooper, you do get, do get to pick up a blaster. There are two triggers on that blaster and one is in the normal position. The other one is kind of at the bottom of the hand grip. Uh, so be very careful when you pick that up because uh, this mission does react to what you do. And if you blow your cover, it becomes much more of a fight and flight type of thing. So I have yet to experience it without someone accidentally triggering their weapon and uh, bringing the garrison down on us. So it is, it's a lot of fun. I, I, I don't know that I'd want to do it another way, but uh, it's certainly, it's certainly. It'd be boring if you just get to tiptoe through the, the, the empire. I just, I, I don't, I don't know if it's different if you do it that way. I, I'm just used to having, you know, it's again, it's the Han Solo uh, running through the Death Star in, in the original Star Wars film uh, where he charges into the, into the, you know, landing bay and there's an entire battalion of stormtroopers there. So that's kind of what it feels like fortunately none of them can hit anything so you're totally safe same old story <laughs> all right so uh, all right i think that kind of will dovetail us a little bit into uh tom if if you have any additional information you want to share about star wars galaxy's edge now that you've had a chance to experience that a little bit more out at disneyland park uh again we'll get into in the news portion talking about the changes that have come uh, out there now that they are kind of out of that initial month of reservation only uh but you know, when you guys went this time, I know you guys got a chance this time to get into Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities, which was something that you had missed out on the first time. What other what other experiences uh, did you have this time around that really stood out for you? Yeah, so we did go to Doc Ondar's, and uh, that was uh, it was excellent. Just to I mean, we didn't. I don't think we no. We bought one thing out of that shop, but mostly I was just looking around at all the little knickknacks that they have around there, and all the uh, just the little stuff that is all over the place that will lead you to this film or this comic or you know whatever it may be and they're just all over the place and the the audio animatronic that is doc ondar is amazing watching him just kind of working around behind the scenes and uh there's just a lot of great high-end stuff more high-end than well, i mean obviously if you're going to go to Savi's workshop and build a lightsaber or if you're going to build a droid i mean those are kind of high-end but as far as some of the other items that are in there just a few more high-end items than you'll see in the actual marketplace but i just enjoyed looking around around and checking out all the different items that were laced around that shop but uh, we also uh we uh, for food this time we hit ronto's roasters and i had a ronto wrap and uh, i enjoyed it very much it's really handy to just kind of carry around with you as you're walking through the land and exploring it's it's basically a a sausage that has a little bit of spice a little bit of a peppercorn sauce to it and but there's some uh some coleslaw there to kind of cool it down it's wrapped up in you know a nice flatbread wrap uh, you know, kind of like a pita wrap or whatever, but I uh, really enjoyed that. And then we've got to play some of the, if you, if you, uh, if you're going to the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, definitely get the play Disney app. Uh, Cause there's a lots of stuff that you can do around there without even being on any of the attractions. There's, they have all sorts of things, games that you can do as you're walking through there. Um, uh, different ways you can read if you don't know like rob does how to read arabesh uh you, you, it'll help you read some of the arabesh that's around there and there's just all sorts of things even in the queues if you're now that the reservation system is done uh the queue for uh millennium falcon smugglers run is a little bit long i, I actually it's been pretty reasonable today i've been kind of monitoring as the day has gone by but uh it's it's 
still, you're going to have a little more time in there, and there are games you can play within the Play Disney app as you're going through the queue as well. So really take advantage of that. Yeah, I would definitely say, just from past experience with the Play Disney app, bring a, a backup charger, an external battery uh, for your cell phone, because I know it does uh, kind of draw on your power supply pretty heavily. Um, but if you've got a backup battery for that, that should save you that issue. And I and I know that a lot of the stuff they've offered in there has been a lot of fun, uh, the ability to kind of, uh, you know, hack some of the crates and uh, decode certain messages. Uh, I believe when you guys were talking with uh, with us about this earlier, you were saying that uh, within the Play Disney app, if you have that open when you're on uh, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, that you can actually get credits for your mission. Yeah, because we we it was one of the benefits this last time is we got to go on Smuggler's Run twice. The first time through, uh, which was actually the first time we, we were gunners on it, which was a fun experience, by the way. Uh, but the second time through, I, I realized it, thought about it and put opened up the play disney app and told them that we're in millennium falcon smugglers run and so after the uh, simulation was finished and we got our you know and and uh, hondo Naka tells us what kind of job we did he did credit us and yes i looked at my phone and yes there were 7800 credits in in our uh, play disney app there waiting for us from our decent job that we did in driving the millennium falcon now have they actually implemented anything within the land that you're aware of that those credits can be used for or is it just kind of a means of keeping score right now? As far as I know, it's just a means of keeping score, but we haven't been in there for long enough to really explore. Now, like now that you can be like, we are, we're in four hour windows and, you know, part of that is going on the attraction. Part of that is going to Oga's Cantina and then doing the shops and stuff. So we haven't really been in, I mean, there's so much, we've been in there a, a total of eight hours now and we haven't even scratched the surface of everything there is to explore there and do there. And it, it wouldn't surprise me if it's somewhere along the lines, if it, if it isn't there, already uh, there's something you can use the credits for i don't know what but uh, it wouldn't shock me at all yeah it'll be interesting to know because um i know that it had been mentioned that you would potentially be able to barter with doc ondar for discounts on merchandise in his shop and it would seem like that would be a really cool way to kind of make those credits worth something where you're getting some sort of a discount on the merchandise um but again, I haven't heard anything about anyone having experience like that. I don't know if that's what they're planning, but uh, hopefully they, they do work it out where that counts for something within the world that, um, you know, makes it makes it a little bit more fun for people to go out there and, and rack up those credits and, and actually have a way to spend them. But even if you don't, there's other things. I mean, yes, the credits, you get credits for doing all these different activities out there. You can do it on the side of the resistance. You can do it on the side of the first order. You can do it as what they call a scoundrel uh, where you're kind of in between or do it you know, kind of a mercenary doing your own thing. Uh, but you know, either you're earning medals, you're earning puzzle pieces, you're earning, uh, different types of uh, parts to uh, different vehicles and stuff. So there's always things to earn that are just kind of rewards, whether they mean anything or not, but it's still just like, yeah, look, I've, I've almost completed this grouping here. So it is something to strive for as you're walking through the land. Yeah. And it's very cool because I mean, again, you can only go on smugglers run so many times before you kind of get used to what's going on and know how to take advantage of that. Although it's always going to be to some degree uh, contingent on the crew you've got but it's nice that they've got you know even just walking around the land you have things that you can do where you can have these experiences or uncover aspects of the land that you had never seen before uh just through you know that play disney app so or the data pad i believe they're calling it so that is super cool um uh, that kind of dovetails a little bit into what we were talking about with the Holonet news portion of it. Uh, first and foremost, do, does that pretty much cover your new experiences within the land or was there anything else that jumped out at you? Yeah, that, that was pretty much it. But I just want to say to everybody out there, we've been there twice. We're blessed. We have been really lucky to be able to be there twice. And it is everything you could imagine it is. It is every time I go there, all I could do is just say, this is the most amazing place I've ever visited at Disney Park park it's it's incredible uh you really do feel separated from disneyland itself it's it really truly does feel like a completely different land uh you do feel like you're entering into it and exiting out of it from uh, someplace else it's it's immersive it's amazing and i know that when you it, believe the hype when you get out there especially if you are any sort of star wars fan but even if you're not uh you're going to enjoy yourself when you go to star wars galaxy's edge right and so you've now gone twice 
place with the preset reservations, but as of today, they have now transitioned into more of an open reservation system where, uh, at least from my understanding, you have to have a ticket um, associated with your uh, Disneyland app account and uh, you can kind of group those tickets if you've got multiple people in your party but uh, you can't actually reserve your boarding pass for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge until you've scanned your ticket for the day so you know if you show up at the park first thing in the morning scan your ticket at that point you can submit yourself for a boarding pass to get into Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is that your understanding? Yeah that's exactly that's and that's the way everything pretty much works at, as, uh, as opposed to at excuse me, at uh, the Walt Disney World Resort where you can book your fast passes or at least some of your fast passes ahead of time. Uh, you cannot do anything, even if you have max pass for Disneyland, even if you have an annual pass or anything, until you actually scan your annual pass or you scan your ticket there and then you can start securing fast passes. And the same thing is what they're doing right now with Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. As soon as you've scanned your ticket, you can go on the app and then you can secure your place in uh, as a boarding spot, a boarding group, uh, per se and they'll they'll tell you you know if you're there really early if you're staying at one of the resort hotels and you get the extra magic hour you'll probably get in there immediately however if you're not it may be later in the day but it'll kind of give you an idea of when it might be and then you can go enjoy the rest of the park you can even go over to disney california adventure park and they'll cue you when it's your time to get in and supposedly it's they they, they tell you, you you don't need to rush there just because that your boarding group is there if you're in the middle of lunch you don't need to throw your lunch away and run to the the gate you can go ahead they give you a two-hour window from when they have told you about it and, and then you can get in if you don't use the app uh, you, you can also, they have fast pass locations at different spots throughout the parks where you can go into and scan your ticket or scan your pass. And they'll give you an actual paper boarding group there. And it works in a similar way. And then you can check back with uh, some signage and some of the uh, guest relations people uh, to find out uh, how that's progressing for you. Yeah. And it is nice that with that system in place, they're still kind of maintaining a benefit for uh, Disney resort guests. You know, it's staying at one of the three Disney owned uh, resort hotels hotels there be it paradise pier uh the disneyland hotel or the grand californian hotel um then if you're actually taking advantage of your on-site privilege of getting into the parks an hour early as you said um you'll be through the gates first you'll be able to secure that boarding pass and get in relatively early but it's still going to allow for guests that are not staying at those resort hotels be they annual pass holders that are coming for the day or people staying at any of the good neighbor hotels or any of the other hotels near area can still come when the park opens and have a pretty good chance to uh, secure a boarding pass although i'm guessing that's going to go down pretty quickly uh, as the morning kind of churns on so i know when we're out there in september we're going to be planning on getting there uh, nice and early at least a couple of the days yeah the benefit is that since you're coming from the east coast you'll time wise you'll be ready to oh, be yeah, up and moving that early so right i know kim right, will be right. i know kim will be ready to be moving that early right right yeah it never works out that way on vacation she runs on a different clock so <laughs> i'm the one i'm the one who can't sleep so yeah but uh the other way in and uh you you one thing you and we don't know i haven't heard of anybody doing being able to do a walk up to oga's or savi's workshop uh but uh, you, they do tell you you need, will need a reservation to get into those spots if you're planning on going to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And those open up at 7 a.m. every day. So you can go online uh, to the different, there's a couple different websites you can go to for which one you want. And you can see if there is a reservation time for you. I went, I went just to see this morning, signed on to the uh, website for Oga's Cantina at about 7.04 this morning. And I was able, if I wanted to, I could have gotten a reservation for 125 today. And the good thing about it is if you, if you are planning on doing that, and if you do get a reservation, you don't need to sign up for a boarding group. Uh, if you have a reservation for one of those spots, Savi's Workshop or Oga's Cantina, they will let you into Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Very cool. That's good to know. I was just going to ask that question. I had to assume that they were going to assign you to a boarding group surrounding whatever your appointment time was because they were going to have to have a way to kind of count you as a, a person that was within the land at that particular point in time so that's uh, very good to know they've already got that sorted out and i think so far this looks like a pretty promising system for them um, it'll be interesting to see 
you know, how this shakes out and what they choose to adopt for Walt Disney World, because I think we can all agree that they're not going to be able to just have a free for all there. Right. Most of the time today I've been watching, I've been on and off just checking the app to see what the wait time was for Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. And uh, you can almost tell when there is a new boarding group coming in because suddenly it would jump up to around 90 minutes for a little bit, then maybe back down to 70 minutes. But most of the time it was sitting around somewhere around 45 to 50 minutes, which, yeah, I mean, that's that's a bit of a wait, but that definitely reasonable. And like I said before, in the queue, there are, it's, there's lots of interesting things to check out, lots of interesting things going on. And if you want to take advantage of the Play Disney app, it, that time will fly by for sure. Well, and it's hugely preferable to stories like what you hear coming out of Universal uh, in Orlando, where they've opened the new Hagrid uh, coaster, the motorbike coaster. And the wait for that has been anywhere from eight to 10 hours. People are waiting to ride that. So uh, I'm very happy that Disney has kind of made it a point to keep the wait times for that reasonable and kind of, you know, control the expectations of the guests that are coming into the parks because there'd be nothing worse than spending a bunch of time hoping to get into Galaxy's Edge and then either not getting in or getting in late and you've missed out on a huge chunk of your day that you could have been experiencing other things. Yeah, it, it would be unfortunate if you're just taking a trip out there and you and this is the one big thing you you want to do but you don't get in but they, they, they do seem to be as long as you are willing to jump on it early they're they're giving you reasonable opportunities to to get in there and try this land out by the way i wanted to go back to the reservation system just a little bit when you do book a reservation for either ogus canteen or Asabi's workshop you do need to have a credit card on your account and if you don't show up they will charge you it's only ten dollars for ogus cantina but it's two hundred dollars if it's Asabi's workshop so just be prepared for that i mean but obviously if you're going to book this reservation most likely you, you're going to want to go and that's all the more reason why they don't want to put you in in some sort of boarding group they, that you may or may not be able to get in they want to make sure you can use this reservation and not have to charge you right and just to be clear that two hundred dollars is essentially the cost of of building your base saber at savvy's workshop so it's not unreasonable they just want to guarantee that you know that you have skin in the game if you're going to make that reservation so you're not stealing a spot from someone else and there's no uh financial repercussion for you so uh, i think that's completely fair and i'm sure that in a in a case where a guest runs into some sort of an emergency or whatever that they'd be willing to work with them but uh, i would certainly expect that uh you know barring any unforeseen circumstances you should expect to be there uh, at or just before your reservation time and make sure you get to enjoy that experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, because, I mean, you're paying for it. You might as well. Uh, Ogus Cantina is really enjoyable. The drinks are a little pricey, but uh, the entertainment is excellent and the, just the feel of the of the cantina itself. We haven't experienced Savi's workshop yet, but I've seen everybody enjoyed what they've brought out of there and seemed that they, 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 they uh, rave about the experience. If you're willing to put down 200 bucks or more uh, to build your lightsaber. They say it's it's it almost brings a tear to your eye when you ignite that lightsaber for the first time. So pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I've heard nothing but rave reviews about it. Um, I'll be very interested to see it. I mean, I've seen some of the Force FX sabers. You know, I've I've held those in the past and uh, had some kind of up close experience with them. And uh, got uh, three different uh, lightsabers of my own. Uh, my son actually has one of them, and I've got the other two. But you know, they're they're certainly more than $200 a piece, but they are definitely worth what was paid for them in terms of the craftsmanship. But from everything I'm hearing, uh, the people who have spent 200 plus to build one of these sabers feel like, you know, they're getting a quality product for that. And on top of it, the whole show experience. Uh, the one interesting thing that I did see today when I was reading about it is that originally when they had started doing the reservations for Savi's workshop, it was the one person who was coming in to build the saber could bring one additional guest to kind of watch. And what I was reading today is they've now upped that to where you can bring two guests to watch um, the show. So I, I'll be interested to see if that is in fact what has uh, been the case, if they've made a change to that process or if that was just a uh, misreported uh, piece of information. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read anything about it or seen anything about that, but that's interesting I, I also want to mention that we did when we did go into Dok Ondar's if you don't want to do Savi's workshop they do have what they call legacy sabers there uh, that are really great they're, they're actually sabers that are like uh, they're like uh, uh, Luke's lightsaber or Ahsoka Tano's lightsabers or Darth Maul's lightsaber and they look really authentic they look they, they, they come in a really nice case to bring them out with and of course you get the blade of your choice and everything I, I tell you Rob I was looking at those Ahsoka Tano 
Toriano lightsabers, and I I wasn't really dying to buy any lightsabers while I was there, but I, I thought about it for a little bit because you get two of them <laughs> and they look sleek, and uh, I, I it nearly made me pull out the wallet for a second there. Yeah, they had actually uh, Disney Parks had put out an Ashley Eckstein uh, video. It was her best day ever, where she was basically doing you know she kind of got taken into Galaxy's Edge for a day of playing by herself and got to build her own droid and got to uh you know hold her lightsabers etc and so she she was pretty thrilled about the whole thing um again it all looks great to me Uh, i'm just excited to get in there and check it out for myself which actually uh, i may get a chance to do that kind of feeds into our other holonet news story of the week or one of our other holonet news stories of the week which is that it was just announced a couple days or a few days ago that uh, walt disney world is actually going to have a preview of galaxy's edge for annual pass holders it's specific to only the top three tiers of annual pass holders. So that would be the premier pass holders. And that is the pass that will get you access to uh, unlimited access to Walt Disney world and Disneyland park, um, across both coasts. And then the platinum plus tier, which is the next tier down from that, which is the top tier for just Walt Disney world. And the one tier below that, which is the platinum level, which is essentially all the same benefits of platinum plus without some water parks and some other, uh, minor Minor features. So if you are an annual pass holder at Walt Disney World and, and hold one of those passes, uh, I would definitely encourage you to kind of keep an eye out if you think that uh, getting down there at some point in August for a preview is something that might be interesting to you. Um, I'm certainly going to be watching. I will post on our social media accounts uh, for the show as soon as that information has been made available in terms of what the dates are and when they sent out the link to sign up. Uh, again, if you're an annual pass holder, typically with these events, you can bring a guest but they also must be an annual pass holder with one of those three tiers of passes so uh if if you qualify for that and it's something you're interested in definitely keep an eye out for that because i think these pass holder previews are going to be a great way to get in there and experience this without some of the crowds that are likely to hit when the land opens uh for real on august 29th no no question about it and the reason why the other annual passes really aren't included in this is because they're in blackout dates during that whole period so uh, they wouldn't be able to get into the parks anyway that's a that's a big part of it but also if you happen to be a and they haven't announced this and i don't know anything about it but just if you happen to be a dvc member or you happen to be a member a, a d23 gold or gold family member you might want to keep an eye out for something along those lines too because a lot of times there'll be something included with them that they'll put out a little something where they'll be part of these previews as well i don't know that they'll happen this time but it has happened in the past so it wouldn't surprise me if they included some of them as well yeah i actually was went back and did a little bit of research um today about kind of how this was released for pandora which was uh The other kind of similar uh, big brand name world that they were uh, releasing back in 2017 at the Disney parks. And I believe the actual opening date for that land was May 27th. And it was about two weeks prior to that, that they started um, pass holder uh, preview dates and it went for like 10 days. So uh, assuming that follows a similar trend, we're probably looking at, you know, mid to to late August is going to be the dates that they're going to have for this. So again, uh, it just depends on what your schedule is. If you have that annual pass and, and what your ability is to get down there and check it out. But uh, it's going to be something that I'm going to snag a date for and then do my very best to make it work. I'll just have to hitchhike or, uh, you know, hijack a, a speeder bike there you go i have i'll have my fingers crossed for you sir yeah i got we <laughs> M- michelle and i got to be part of that pandora we, i think we got in and for a preview on the 25th so a couple of days before it opened uh officially and uh i i can't remember i i know we weren't dvc members at that time we were d23 gold members and i believe we were annual pass holders at that time so it was one of those mm. two but uh yeah we we just happened to be lucky enough that it fell during one of our trips when we were going to be out there so uh, we took advantage of that yeah I mean, and again, I just just based on the experience you guys had getting in there with that reservation period, which uh, I think it's a little bit more difficult for them to do an annual pass holder preview out at Disneyland Resort, given the fact that there are so many annual pass holders. Um, so I think the the route they went was a better bet for them. But uh, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how this all pans out and how many days they release and how many slots there are. So Right. And I would bet it would go similar to what they did with Pandora and similar to what they did with the reservation system at Disneyland. 
Disneyland that they'll have, give you windows that you can come in because that's exactly how it was when we went to Pandora is that there was a window to come in for, I, I want to say it was, it was only like three hours. It wasn't quite four hours. There's not quite as much to do in Pandora as there is in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. It was either two or three hours that you could get in there, but you could easily get on both attractions during that time. So I would imagine that they'll have something along the lines of the reservation system where there's this four hour window, then there's this four hour window. Don't know for sure, but that I, I could foresee that happening. Yeah. And I don't even want to do this. I'm doing it specifically for this podcast and for the children. For the children. Always for, for the, the children. For the younglings. Exactly. So uh, the only other piece of news that we've got today that occurred during my hiatus here over the past couple of weeks was that uh, they finally did put the tickets for Star Wars Celebration Anaheim 2020 on sale. And as expected, the Jedi Master Passes, which are kind of the VIP exclusive, uh, you get you know, unlimited access to whatever panels, uh, you first choice access to whatever panels you're interested in and, uh, full access to uh, the venue and, and a number of other benefits as well as some of the four day, uh, regular passes. Actually, I believe all the four day passes have sold out at this point. Uh, Saturday, I believe is almost completely sold out and Friday is getting up there as well. So, uh, if you are interested in, uh, looking into a possibility of getting out there to Star Wars Celebration next year in Anaheim. I know it's a quick turnaround from this year's celebration, uh, but definitely keep an eye open. Uh, look at what your options are, what the ticket availability is, and uh, do your very best to make that happen. Uh, I will say that if they follow the same pattern that they followed with Star Wars Celebration 2019 in Chicago, it was very heartening to see that they actually came out with their own legit manner of uh, folks that had purchased uh, tickets for Star Wars Celebration who, for whatever reason, weren't going to be able to go, uh, were able to unload those tickets uh, via a quote-unquote approved legal means as, as opposed to scalping them. Uh, and it looked like that was something that went over very well with this year's celebration. I would expect that to continue. So if you did not get the ticket you're looking for, there is still hope out there. Um, it's just going to be something where you're going to have to be flexible and it should be something that you can look into as uh, Celebration 2020 gets close. Yeah, I and the one good thing about it is, yes, it, it is kind of a short turnaround, like you said, from uh, Star Wars Celebration in Chicago 2019, but at least they pushed it back to August. So it's kind of a year and a half difference. It's not, you know, April to April. So it gives you a little bit more time to, you know, get the, <laughs> the money up for the plane tickets and all those knickknacks you're going to want to purchase when you're out there. Yeah. And definitely, if you think that even getting in uh, as a latecomer, uh, grabbing some tickets late in the game is something you might want to look in, I would still definitely recommend go out there look for those star wars celebration room blocks and uh potentially try to grab yourself one of those uh because the hotel rooms are what's going to be tough to get as star wars celebration gets closer yeah uh, we already we, we we actually have our passes already we did get the four day passes before those sold out uh, michelle my wife and myself and we did book a hotel as well and <laughs> excuse me there was an interesting procedure going through the hotels because you'd click on one and you'd like ready for the and then it would go there's no rooms available so you go back and then all these rooms they would appear and they disappear it was quite a process on the first day i'm sure it's much more smooth now if you want to go in there and try and get onto those room blocks i think we figured out what the con and uh <laughs> the con and comic con stands for um you know with these conventions it's it's definitely tough to kind of keep up with what the availability is because there are so many people that are just jumping on this stuff and trying to get it nailed down and i'm guessing that a lot of that availability issue is just what i was talking about it's probably people who aren't even necessarily guaranteed to go uh, but they're kind of holding out on the off chance that they're able to score tickets through one means or another uh, just to make sure that they've got a place to land when they get out there. Right. Because you, if you were going to try and book a hotel, you didn't have to have an, a, you know, already purchased a ticket anywhere. You could have just gone on their site and gone ahead and, and booked a hotel. So even if, uh, and, and the, the, it's not one of those hotels where you're paying it up front and there's no cancellation policy. Uh, the, the, you can cancel at least for the one that we got 72 hours out. So, uh, it, you know, keep looking if their hotel, tell you want isn't available right now there is a wait list way to go through their site and do it but also you can just kind of keep an eyeballing it and see what pops up also there are many hotels if you don't know the disneyland resort there are many good neighbor and smaller hotels in and around the general vicinity in that area that were 
part part of these room blocks. So there are still good hotel rooms available if you just want to do that searching in that way as well. Yeah, terrific information. Uh, I was basically going to say pretty much the same thing myself. And so uh, having you say it uh, saved me a bunch of breath. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, uh, well, we went a little longer than I was originally anticipating, but I kind of figured this may happen because I certainly uh, missed doing the podcast while I was off and was excited to get back here and get another episode going. And certainly with, uh, you know, the content that we're talking about today, it's stuff that we uh, regularly take advantage of. Um, and I know both Tom and myself enjoy all the various Star Wars offerings at the Disney parks. And hopefully, uh, you know, if you're going down there for Galaxy's Edge or going out to Disneyland Park for Galaxy's edge uh, and have not been to the Disney parks before, you will take advantage of some of this information and kind of uh, find a way to fit some of this stuff into your day because it's going to be kind of the one-stop park for the Star Wars fan for the foreseeable future and uh, it would be, you know behoove you to check out all the various aspects of it. Yeah, and I, I I still I'll tell you right now we've been there eight hours we haven't done nearly everything I don't know if you could be there from rope drop to fireworks and still do everything it's it's an amazing land they've done such a great job I know I sound like I'm just overselling it I'm just a shill for Disney and Lucasfilm but that's really what I believe yeah well again I mean they're the only ones in the game right now and they could have easily uh, lowered the bar on this and it sounds like they did not do that in the least that it is definitely geared toward Star Wars fans of all experience levels. You can, uh, you know there's different levels of things that you can pick up on. I appreciate you outing me on my aura bash. I'm either going to gain or lose listeners based on that. Um, so <laughs> hopefully it's the gain, but, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't speak Klingon, but, um, I'm working on, I'm working on being able to decipher the aura bash. So <laughs> yeah, terrific. So Tom, uh, again, I was fortunate enough yesterday to join you guys to talk about solo, a star Wars story in the star Wars remembered series that you guys have been doing. I would certainly encourage all our listeners here at the Jedi Temple Archives podcast to go check out that. And if you're a Disney fan, definitely check out their other podcasts. They have a lot of great content. Uh, Tom and Michelle and the way they run their podcast is one of the things that really inspired me to uh, take the plunge and kind of go into this uh, from a Star Wars perspective. And we always have a great time getting together and talking about Star Wars uh, within, you know, the, within the Disney films, within the original trilogy films, and uh, within really all you know, all aspects of Star Wars. So, uh, Tom, you want to give some information on how they can find that podcast and, and the series that you're doing? Sure. Thanks, Rob. We do have fun, don't we? I'm telling you, it doesn't surprise me. You said this would be a short podcast. I knew we would talk lot for longer than you expected, <laughs> but we have a good time. Uh, yeah, you can find our podcast. Best place to find us. We have our own website, HyperionAdventuresPodcast.com. You can also find us pretty much everywhere you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We now just recently gone on to iHeartMedia in their podcast part. Uh, and if you want to follow us socially, we are on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. We have a lot of fun talking Disney, talking Marvel, talking Star Wars, giving you tips for the parks, uh, and just just having a good old time, you know, in, in, in around Disney, Star Wars, Marvel. Yeah, and the thing is, is that whether you're a huge Disney fan or not, a lot of the information they give when you do go to experience Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and this other Star Wars content, uh, the, a lot of their tips are going to help you save time and frustration when you go in if you're not super experienced with Disneyland or Walt Disney World. Uh, so there is a lot of value to checking that out. And who knows, you may just find that you uh, kind of expand your, your sphere of interest interest uh, beyond just the Star Wars content. I will also point out that I know that Tom and Michelle have been kind of starting to rise up some of the iTunes charts, uh, which is really cool to see. And congratulations to you guys for that. So uh, I think that's just going to make it easier and easier for people to find you and uh, really grow your podcast. Thanks. Uh, we really appreciate it. it, was a, it was, I had received this email the other day saying we'd uh, at this certain place within the charts and it shocked me. It, it was really kind of cool news to hear. And, uh, you know, it's thanks to all all of our listeners and thanks to you coming on Rob so many times. I mean, you provide great content every time you come on our show as well. We always enjoy our time with you. Yeah, I always appreciate you guys giving me an outlet to talk Star Wars, so I can never, never get enough of that. Uh, would love to hear more from uh, our listeners in terms of the things that you're interested in hearing about. 
Uh, we've, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we've had some really cool emails that have come in from listeners, uh, be it with topics for future shows or just feedback on kind of how they found us and how they enjoy listening to us. So again, a huge thank you to our listeners. Um, watching our listenership grow is definitely something that encourages me every week. Uh, I'm very humbled that there are people out there that want to listen to myself drone on about Star Wars. Uh, but this has been something that has really been there, you know, since I was a little kid. And it's just a, a cool social phenomenon that's been going on. And it really has uh, kind of warmed its way into pop culture all across the spectrum. Uh, I know that, Tom, you guys have just gone and seen Toy Story 4 uh, last week. We went and saw it over the weekend. And I had Star Wars references jumping out at me within that film. So it is literally everywhere you look. Um, and, and there's a lot of deeper um, meaning and deeper messages uh, within the Star Wars film. So the more you learn, the more interesting it is. And I'm just really hoping that, that uh, the folks that listen to this podcast can start to see some of that uh, if they haven't already and, and really get a whole new appreciation for the content that's out there within the Star Wars universe. So again, thank you so much to all our listeners. Uh, you found us today and I appreciate you for that. If you're ever looking for uh, you know our podcast on other podcast platforms and can't find us, shoot us an email at jtapodcast at gmail.com and I will make sure that we get uh, put out on those additional platforms. If Again, if you have any ideas for future shows, if you have questions that you'd like us to explore in future episodes, reach out to us at that JTA podcast at gmail.com address or look for us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at JTA podcast. And we will look forward to hearing from you and to talking to you next week uh, when we bring you our next show. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Tom, for joining us and uh, may the force be with you. Thank you.